everybody. My name is Liz Farrell. I'm the Artistic Director for Painting, Drawing, and Printmaking here at Anderson Ranch. Welcome to our virtual art salon. I'm really honored to introduce Sakria Rabani, who I have the fortune of being able to work with. He is the Studio Coordinator of Sculpture here at Anderson Ranch. Zach is exhibited nationwide in galleries, museums, competitions, and public art spaces, and has been a resident at the Fraconia Sculpture Park in Schaefer, Minnesota. He was a finalist for the 2019 Foundwork Artist Prize and is a 2019 Art Fields Best Installation Performance winner. Welcome, Zakria. Hey, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Zakria Rabani, and I'm super excited to be here with you all. <laughs> Um, let me just share my screen real quick so we can get started. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. How does that look? Great. Um, so Zach, this first image shows a detail of your decks and desks series in which you augment traditional utilitarian school desks with your own more organic surface designs. And um, you incorporate handmade skateboard decks. Can you tell us a little bit about how this series came about and um, sort of how it's evolved? Yeah, definitely. So uh, this piece in particular was one of the first sculptures I ever made. It was when I was trying to understand what sculpture was. And it stems from, as most of my art do, does, uh, from a story from my life. So in, in grade school, we would, my friends and I would draw on desktops with our you know, pencils and graphite pens, markers. And we would create these like narratives and these illustrations, and then we would leave class. And then for a while, uh, during one time, I would come back to the class the next day and someone else would have drawn on my desk. And so we started to collaborate, me and this unknown person, and we would make these fascinating drawings. They would go all the way to the edge of the desk. And then at the end of the week, the teacher would tell us to erase it and we'd lose it all, but we'd eventually start over. And uh, at some point I was talking to my friends about it and it turned out that one of my best friends had been sitting in the same desk I had been, just a different class period. So him and I had been collaborating together, but we didn't know. And, and one of the things that developed from that feeling, that sensation was this drawing that you see here. Um, so this is kind of what I call like a flow system drawing. And that's what this whole series was kind of about. It was about this idea of flow where in like positive psych, it's, it's a state that you can enter and it becomes like a state of perfection. If you're an athlete, you might recognize it more often, but it happens in artists, happens to all of us in different parts of our lives. And it's a, it's a state of pure bliss. It's not very long but it's just one of those moments where you feel like you can't do anything wrong. And so I wanted to create this show or this, this series that would maybe exemplify this, invite uh, viewers to sit down or check out the boards and kind of really fill out the space. And you know, I wanted to challenge them on what their idea of potential was and what their idea of potential was for them. Great. Um, well, uh... These works are a compelling intersection between utilitarian design and a response to recreation. Um, who are some artists or designers that have influenced your work and process? Yeah, great question. Uh, so one of the first artists I ever really stumbled upon was Tom Sachs. And that was because in art school, I was asked to pretend like I was collaborating with an artist. So I drew a name out of a hat and this was the artist that I drew was Tom Sachs. And I really love the raw like in, in nature of his work, the, in the simplicity and kind of just, you know, he seemed like a go-getter at the time. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Uh, and one of, while I was researching him, one of the, one of the things I found, it was a quote, um, you know, in Tom Sachs' work, he he leaves all of his marks, his pencil drawings, you know, where he makes his cuts, his, you'll see a lot of permanent marker on his works. And when he was asked about it, he goes, you know, this is part of my labor. Like, why would I hide part of my labor? I want you to see some, you know, the work that I've done. And that's kind of a motto that I've really like 
really enjoyed and kept with me for a long time. Uh, another artist in a different note is Mona Hatoum. I found her work just insanely compelling. And, and when I was in school, I had a lot of mist. I still do have a lot of mysteries of my of my heritage in the Middle East. And so naturally, I kind of found Mona Hatoum and her practice. She uses found objects and she you know looks takes ordinary objects and kind of transforms them sometimes to have this like dark or eerie nature to them. But she also really researches, you know, the history of these objects and the people that they're associated with and, and challenges viewers to consider the community that they're in and the contributions that they have to that community. Like how can they make it better? Or, or also like this idea of potential that maybe some people don't know that they have. Great. Um, so in this series, um, you take another everyday utilitarian institutional object and subvert it by turning it inside out and hanging it on the wall as an art object. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this project and how you ventured into working with found objects that contain a personal history? Yeah, so after the Dex and Dust piece, I started to really gain this understanding of found objects and, and the weight that they carry, the value and the importance that they can have. I started to think of objects as things, you know, that, that carry pieces of another person's soul, maybe their owner or maybe where they were constructed. Uh, so this, this series flipped their found or donated backpacks and they've been flipped inside out and then hung on the wall. And part of this this series is to kind of make an object that's super familiar to all of us, you know, something that I've worn on my back for probably more than half of my life and make it feel unfamiliar, you know, pulling the insides out and really diving into the, those formal constructions of the material, you know, maybe pushing the viewer to consider where the backpack was constructed. It shows maybe more wear and tear on what that individual was carrying inside. It maybe gives a more personal viewpoint and so one of the tricks about putting them on the wall like this in this format was to kind of urge viewers to get closer to the object. You know, you, it feels familiar, but you're also kind of unsure. So then you get closer and then you start to really see the wear and tear. You see kids names that are written on it and you kind of and you start to think it back to your own experiences or consider that whose backpack was this and what kind of experiences have they had too? and maybe there's a relationship between you and that person. Uh, here are a couple uh, details, just some fine tune so you can see the construction on the insides. Great, well, um, I'm again curious about what artists or artists um, have inspired you to think about used clothing or objects as a way to explore personal or collective narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of my favorite artists of all time is Doris Salcedo. Uh, she uses predominantly found objects and often maybe transform them or add other materials to them. Uh, but what I love about her work is, you know, she has a, a such a unique way of preserving those objects and then really making the viewer consider the history of that object. And so in this piece and also in other ones where she has furniture and she fills the furniture with concrete and it's literally preserving that experience or nostalgia or those memories of whoever this object was, you know, belonged to. And so she deals with a lot of, you know, violence from her, from her, where she grew up and from third world countries. And so it has a different feel to it, but it was something that I always related to. How can I take an object add another layer, add another layer, transform it, and then create a space, you know, to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, let's see. And then this is, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a shot of your studio with an in-process installation involving actual skateboards, um, skateboard decks. And the piece that you're going to talk about is called Divine Decks. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about it and how your installations have become more involved and multifaceted since the first two, the first two that you showed are a little bit simpler, maybe, I mean, the desks come together to create a 
a pretty complex uh, installation as well. But um, I'm curious about how this sort of multiplicity in this work has come together to make um, a really sort of more complex um, installation. Yeah, so thinking about the works we just showed and, and this idea of, of collaboration, this idea of adding another layer, how, how do you, you know, when you find an object that you're interested in or you find hundreds of them that you're interested in, it's, I have this fear of sometimes transforming them, manipulating them too much so they're no longer the object that, that, that I love. So uh, thinking about those kind of notions, I started to create these environments where I, I was, wasn't, manipulating the decks too much. I was just simply drilling two holes in it and tying a shoelace through it. And then I wanted to keep adding other layers and, and, and more layers. How do I make this more multifaceted? How do I express what I'm trying to convey? And so this piece really came together. It has this like chandelier aspect, but it's a, it's kind of like a labyrinth and you're, the viewers are kind of urged again to, to get closer to the objects, something that's familiar, but now it's hanging from the ceiling. And they're all hung by shoelaces. And all of these skateboards come from uh, the Skate Park of Tampa and their Boards for Bros organization. So another collaboration. Their, their organization works in a way that people will donate skateboards to them and they'll repurpose the decks, the wheels, the trucks, and then they'll give them complete decks to kids in need. And then those kids will draw on them and mark make on them and you get to keep them. And now that that gift has now moved on to a child. But these decks have all been deemed defective, right? They, they no longer have pop, they don't have function. So my concern was, well, I believe that these objects have a piece of their owner's soul. So if they just sit and stack, then does that soul die? And how can we kind of refurbish that soul or bring that soul back together? And also, I'm curious about how the sort of underappreciated everyday object that's sort of the discarded object, how that, you know, has significance to you in your work. Yeah, it's, you know, there, there are certain objects, you know, that when you see them, you just fall in love with them. And, and skateboarding has always been that way. I, I've felt that way with a lot of other objects in my life. You know, an object to me that seems like it's been through so much feels important. It feels important to me and it, and it makes me think about well, whose was this and I wonder if that person's important. If I find that this object's important, maybe I find them important too. And, you know, this idea of bringing all of these people, all of these skateboards together in one place was something, you know, I wanted to create this community, this environment, this happy place of potential that viewers could kind of enter as they please. They could get close to the object and see these same marks that I see them. They could see them in their own ways. Um, this is Wes Box. Uh, he's a phenomenal skater uh, from Skate Park of Tampa. And so I, I was able to invite him over too. And so he actually knew a lot of the skaters and these he knew which boards belong to which people. So expanding that narrative even more so to this group of skaters, this whole skate culture, bringing them into the gallery and having them, you know, describe these narratives was, was actually really amazing. So people could actually come in and potentially recognize a board from, as being belonging to someone or as yeah. like history like that. Uh, you know, just like reading a book, skaters can walk up to a board and they could read the skateboard. They could tell you, you know, maybe they know who's it's from or who the graphics are from, but they could also tell you how that skater skates. You know, did, is the board waterlogged? Were they, you know, messy skaters? Did they do a lot of rails? Was it vert or, you know, was in, you know, street or skate or out in the, in the park? So that's, that's super fascinating. So that's like the skate culture side kind of seeping into this other, you know, maybe fine arts or gallery setting but then also vice versa, where the fine art world is kind of seeping into the skate culture world and bringing both of those populations together. Can you talk a little bit also about how the cast, how, how these pieces are lit and how the cast shadows work? So one of the things I tried to achieve in my Dex and Death show was the shadow effect. And the shadow effect dealt 
with uh, Islamic geometry. So it was like this, there's a lot of history in, in my background and my dad has this weird way of never telling me my history and he finds it kind of funny. So it was left to me to do the research on my own. And some of it was imagination, some of it was hopefulness, some of it was all kinds of stuff. So I, I really had a, a love for these Islamic uh, geometry, like these patterns. And so one of the things I was able to do with this Divine Deck series is because of the way we lit the piece, it would blow the shadows onto the ground of all these decks and kind of create this symmetrical pattern, some kind of geometrical. And what, what I loved about it is, you know, viewers could walk on these shadows. They could become a part of the shadows. So they in turn become an addition. Their shadow becomes a part of the pattern. Uh, and so that was one of the, the reasonings behind at least that kind of lighting. In, I'm not sure, in this piece, you can kind of see the shadows on the wall. So the way the piece is set up is you can walk into, there's two layers. There's an inside layer and an outside layer. And so you can walk in the outside layer, layer where you can be with multiple people and you know checking out the boards, but then there's a more intimate and a smaller confined area. And in that area, there's a, a pulley. So if you pull that pulley, a light will uh, turn on and it'll blow those shadows. It'll warm up the space, make it feel inviting and it'll blow those, those shadows onto the wall. And that's kind of that series in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Zach. I like we're ending with a, a, a picture of you. Um, and I love this sort of the stacked, um, I've been in your studio and I've definitely seen these stacks of boards and as a printmaker who loves rep repetitive imagery and, and all of that, I'm really interested in that. Um, so it's very in intriguing. Um, so now we have a chance for some questions from our attendees. So if you have a question at this point, you can hit the, um, Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can type in a question or you can hit um, the hand button as a way of raising your hand and we can um, do a live question answer with that as well. So whatever people are comfortable with, um, please feel free to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see. I think we have some sculpture fact faculty too that we're going to pull in. Yeah, we have. Um, hi, everyone. This is Esther here. Uh, we have uh, Stephanie Victor who has raised uh, who has raised hand. I'm going to go ahead and allow them to talk so they can ask Zach their question directly. Awesome. Mm, Stephanie, you're on. Are you there? Oh. Yes. Am I unmuted? Yes, yeah. you're good. Cool. Um, thank you. That was really great to see. Um, I possibly walked in a few minutes late, so I may not have seen the very first. <laughs> um, but one thing that I sort of noticed between the, the, the deck piece and the school desk piece is that both um, seem really contingent on having, and the backpacks as well, um, objects that are sort of recognizable to the general public and even mm -hmm maybe kind of like a, a, a mixing of cultures. Like you talked about getting skaters to come into the gallery and talk about stories. And that's probably not like your typical, you know, snobby art audience. Um, and so I guess I'm sort of curious to what degree is that sort of a critical component of your work? And to what degree are you sort of thinking in advance about like how the objects that you choose will draw in um, different kinds of communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful question. Thanks, Stephanie, for, for hopping on. Stephanie's one of our sculpture faculty writing a workshop in 2021. So we're pretty excited. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, are. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, growing up as a kid, I, I was a pretty big troublemaker. So it was kind of like on a day in, day out basis, I felt like I was always being restricted or uh, limited to something or some kind of rules. So I, I've developed that kind of way of thinking since I was a, a child. And these objects, you know, well, one, are, are they objects that I can get multiples of? And then two, you know, do they have a relationship to me? And 
You know, I find a lot of the objects we use, even in school, like I was obsessed with rubber bands and making, you know, forming paper clips and making these little toys um, from paper and all these fun names. And so those, you know, I start to think about well, why are, are these objects important? And if they are important, how are they important? Like, how does this, these, these simple, how do these simple materials who we've all, you know, we've all experienced, we've all touched paper, we've all touched, you know, used a pen or a pencil. Some of us have kept pencils for probably longer than we should have. And what is that, what is that connection like? So uh, that's kind of what I look for in the pieces. And one of the things I like to do too is, can I find a lot of them or, or can people donate them to me? How can I extend this idea of collaboration and, and sharing other people's stories uh, through these objects? Uh, and the skateboards was just a perfect opportunity to kind of do that. Yeah, great. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so we have a few questions in the Q and A. Um, Liz, you want to go ahead and read those? Sure. Thank you, Esther. Um, we have one from Pam Brandt. Her question is: Will you be making any sculptures with repurposed volleyball nets? Ah, uh, so wow, volleyball nets. Um, so Pam must know that I'm a pretty avid volleyball player. I, I have been in the volleyball community my mostly my entire life. I've never thought of doing something with the net, but I have thought of doing a piece with the volleyballs. And so if anyone's ever been to a volleyball tournament or a beach volleyball tournament, uh, everyone kind of brings their own ball and then they sign it, they draw on it, they make it really decorative. And so I have thought for a long time what it would be like to kind of collect some of these older volleyballs that are either discontinued or the circuit doesn't use them anymore. And then make a piece out of, out of that. I, I haven't delved into it much more than that, um, but it, that's a pretty good, great question. Great. Um, we have another question from mm -hmm. Andrea Jenkins Wallace, and she is also an artistic director here. Um, her question is, um, your work seems to lend itself to the idea of community-based art. Have you ever worked with communities to do public art projects? Um, I would say yes and no. I've done public art and I've done, uh, I guess an example would be, so in grad school, I had the opportunity to work with the New Orleans Airlift and they do these massive uh, projects where they build these shanty houses, kind of like a small village. And each of these houses have a musical component to them. Um, so it wasn't my piece, but it was, I was able to work with them and collaborate and help them with the ideas and help them to labor. And we were able to bring, you know, all of Seminole Heights, that whole kind of Tampa area together. And we had like a musical performance and, and uh, some of the shanty houses were activated by other viewers. So it wasn't just, we had performers there either dancing or singing or playing musical instruments, but also the, the community was there and they were interacting and they were making their own music. They were, you know, tagging along with the, what was going on. So, I mean, having that experience in grad school has really changed a lot about how I think about art and what I want to do. And, you know, sometimes as an artist, I think about, well, I just need to make this piece and I just need to do it all right here. But then the other part of me is wanting to go out and meet people and bring these objects back in, build these stories, build this archive, uh, you know, this rich history and see how many objects, you know, contain a soul and can we, can I convey that to, to an, a larger audience? Great, um, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Genevieve Lowe. Hi, Genevieve. Um, she asks, can you talk a little bit about the importance of biographies, stories, and narrative in the work? Thinking about the elements of sport and activity in your work, it seems interesting that you focus more on the biography and narrative components rather than the endurance or physical aspects of those items? Uh, so uh, I've been a coach for a long time. I've, I taught tennis and I became a, a tennis professional when I was young and then I ventured into volleyball. And in both of those areas, I became a coach. So a lot of my work doesn't, I don't think talks about stamina because I feel like it can maybe create a weird imbalance with everybody. Um, and from a coaching standpoint, it's like, 
I believe that everyone can do anything, you know, and being able to be that kind of component and push them or encourage them to at least try this new thing. is something I, I really, you know, keep in my teaching philosophy. But one of the things I love in volleyball, and I, you know, volleyball is, is a two man sport in, in my volleyball or beach volleyball is two on two. So it's just you and one other person and coming from tennis where you're completely alone having that extra person on the court was always super gratifying and being able to not think about myself, but think about them. How can I help this person? How can I help them and us become a better team? And how does that collaboration work? So there's a lot about my work, even the, that really long skateboard that we showed earlier was an idea to share the idea of riding with another person or with three people or with four people because of its size. And yeah, it's, sharing that kind of experience or this idea of flow is something I love and I try to exemplify my work in, in every way that I can. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Peter Wanders. He asks, um, and obviously um, president and CAO of Anderson Ranch, he asks, your work lives on the edges of youth culture and fine art. How do you see that as a two-way conversation? How is living in Aspen and Snowmass starting to influence your art? Yeah. Uh, wow, these are all really good questions. You guys have been paying attention. It's good. Um, that's tough. I mean, thinking about my background and thinking about, you know, maybe the youth as underrepresented and how to represent them better is something I think about a lot. And since moving to Aspen, um, it has changed a little bit. The demographic is a lot different. It's maybe not as diverse or, or where I used to live, but I still think that it's an opportunity or, or maybe a challenge to invite those people together. There was a, a piece I did this summer at Franconia where I built this steel S and it was an S that was kind of formatted in this doodle. And if I showed it to you, you'd probably, it was, I think it was on the, the event page. <laughs> And what was ama amazing about that piece is in the park, you know, families would come and go and they would see the piece and they'd be elderly people, uh, different backgrounds, and there would be kids and, all, and everything in between. And it was always fun because the parents or the grandparents would know the symbol, but so would the kid. And even though they may have never talked about it, they both knew that that symbol was there. So that was a, a way for me to bridge that gap. And uh, it would be nice to try to do that again in, in future pieces. Great. Um, we have a question from Patty Byron. Um, Patty asks, um, your work seems to depend somewhat on the energy they hold from the previous owners, like the skateboarder who recognized fellow skaters boards. This tradition of art holding energy goes way back. Do you ever think of your work in this way? Definitely. Uh, it, when I was doing my thesis, I researched a lot about the, this Maori tribe. Um, and from Polynesia, and they would think about gift giving and uh, they would think about it as, as a spirit. So they call it the spirit of the how. And so when you give a gift, you would give a piece of your soul and the spirit of how would travel with that gift. And then if that gift wasn't either reciprocated or passed on, or, you know, if it wasn't, you know, entertained with or played with, that the soul would die. That, and that was their belief. So really pushing that into my work and thinking about not only do these objects, you know, in my opinion, retain pieces of their owner or pieces of the people that they come in contact with, but those memories, those experience, that essence can travel throughout time, right? It can travel all and, and it can teach us later on in the future or in the present. And, you know, they, obviously that's how we can understand history. We start to understand these people's lives and their stories and then we can tie them into our own we can find relationships and say oh yeah i'm not that different from this person who's all the way across the world or and or you can also absorb that information and then use it to better yourself in, in another way okay we have another question from jean killian the question is how important to you is it that you're giving preference to skateboards backpacks and specific items over other objects? That is, how much does the object define a theme for you as opposed to the impact your work has on the flow of light patterns you're creating? Ooh, tough question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of these objects, they just tie into, into my life. They tie into stories that I hold dear to my heart. For a long time, I would, you know, I talk about having absurd experiences as a kid, being a troublemaker and always finding myself in, in not great situations. And these are the kind of the objects that were there. They, they, they experienced those situations with me and then they were able to stay with me after that, that situation was over. And so that kind of relationship that I built with those objects kind of translates into these other objects. Um, and maybe Liz, you could read the second part of that question again. Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, I've got to find it again, I'm sorry. Oh, that is how much does the object define a theme for you as opposed to the impact your work has on the flow of light patterns you're creating? Yeah, so I think recently I try to tie in the light patterns as best as I can, but I don't want to do it so much that maybe it's overwhelming or it overrides the object that I'm, you know, the found objects that I'm using. Um, but I try to just think of these objects, you know, and, and try to exempt, add as many layers as I can without deteriorating it, without deteriorating the, that, that specific image of the object in our minds, and then also physically in the world and then how to add those layers again. So uh, that's a tough question. So thank you for asking. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah. Esther, do we have anybody else with their hand raised or shall I read a um, another typed, typed question? Um, no, no more hands. So you can go ahead and read one of the typed ones. Okay, thanks, Esther. I just wanted to make sure I'm not um, skipping over people. We, we don't have time to answer all questions, but I just wanted to make sure that we're getting to people. Um, we have a question from Leah Agarter. She actually is another Anderson Ranch um, artistic staff person. She runs our digital fab lab. Um, how do you decide when it's time to move on to new objects and new imagery? What ideas are currently brewing in your studio? The answer is never. You never remove yourself from the object. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's something to think about a lot. Like uh, this Divine Dex project was built upon the idea that I would travel to different locations. And because of my connection with Spot and Boards for Bros, I'd be able to accumulate decks from that area and kind of, and then use them for that installation. So the idea was to travel across the country and, and do these shows with decks from each of those regions and have this installation. And that was, you know, I want to fulfill that promise, but as soon as, you know, there is a point where I might feel like I need to move on to something else. And, and, it's, and one of the things I've been thinking about in my practice is kind of going back to these Islamic geometry designs and like the history of where I'm from. And then also how I can translate that to a community aspect, like how I can relate those ideas to the public. So one thing I've been wanting to do for a long time is my father was born in Afghanistan and I'd, I'd love to be able to go back. I, I went when I was a year old, so technically I've been there, but uh, I would love to go there and meet my family that's there and, and see if I have an attraction to Islamic geometry because it's, I have an attraction to it or because it's part of who I am and part of, you know, has that essence or this idea of these objects traveled through me as well. So I would really, that's something I've been thinking about for a long time and I would love to create pieces around that idea um, in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much, Zach, for this insight into your work. That was fantastic. Um, everybody, thank you for participating and for your thoughtful questions. We're really happy to have you here and we would love for you to join us for our next virtual art salon on May 5th at 4 p.m. with studio coordinator of photography and new media, Esther Nooner. Um, we'll see you then. Also, I wanted to mention that Thinker Thursday is on the 21st of May at 4 p.m. And I also would like to mention that our innovation studios are online. And um, this is our summer workshops, uh, online summer workshops. They are on our website. Please take a look. We hope you sign up. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you, everybody. Until next time. 
Thank you, friends and family, Anderson Ranch. Thank you so much.